Well, yesterday I shared that our objective in uh, our conversations with people is not to get into meaningless and trifling arguments about stuff that doesn't really matter. Um, you know, I, <laughs> there, I, I know people who are vegetarians, who are vegans, who uh, don't think you should eat meat. And, um, <clears throat> and I mean, to me, that's not an argument that's even worth having, other than the fact that the Bible says that God has sanctified meat. He sanctified food. He gave it to uh, Noah when I got off the ark, and I don't think that's a biblical teaching. But if you want to nutritionally deprive yourself by not eating good, healthy meat, well, that's your choice. I'm not going to judge you for it. Um, I just know that uh, meat is an essential part of the human diet. And I think the science holds it out. But there again, uh, if you want to buy an electric car, that's up to you. If you don't, you know, I mean, for me, I'm not going to do it because I drive longer distances than that. So if you're only going to put around town and you want to uh, drain the grid, fine, that's up to you. I'm going to continue to put gasoline in my car so I can reach my destinations without concern of running out of power. But these are all the kind of issues that people have conversations about that sometimes we can get so intense and we're finding increasingly that uh, the culture is pressing arguments about things that are nonsensical and unrealistic. I mean, of course, the whole LGBTQ conversation is one of those nonsensical conversations that has no basis in fact or reality, certainly is not scientific or truthful. and. You know, uh, at some point, if a person is willing to have a conversation with me, I'm more than glad to have that conversation. But I find that most of the time, if I simply say, but I don't think that's real or true or scientific, that the response is often angry. It's kind of like the idea of being canceled because you've said something that disagrees with the people who are the fact checkers, <laughs> who, who I... I get the impression wouldn't know a fact if it ran over them on the middle of the freeway. But simply, it's really uh, bias checkers who they look to see who agrees with their bias and then remove you as a consequence. But saying all of that, Paul said we need to know that at the central core of everything we do is that we can lead them to repentance and into the knowledge of the truth. We're not trying to win. We're not trying to be competitive. We're not trying to prove them wrong and prove us right. You know, that kind of um, vicious bantering and competition is not important. If uh, they go away disagreeing with me and standing their ground, uh, I'm fine with that. But I'm simply not going to violate my own conscience by saying something that's not true or agreeing with something that's not true. Nor am I going to, uh, nor I hope do I offend them and drive them away because I become defensive and reactive, which is really an indication that I'm insecure in my beliefs and I'm unsure of what is true. And therefore, I'm using the same tactics they're using to win the argument and control the conversation. Because, you know, you can control a conversation and still lose the argument. <laughs> you know, so, you know, basically talking people into a corner uh, isn't going to necessarily change their mind. They're just going to probably conclude that you're a complete jerk and they don't like you. But when we talk to them, it's not because we want to have them like us either. We want to see them come to a repentance, a churn of direction, and come to a knowledge of the truth. Because Paul put it this way. He said, here's a real problem in verse 26. He says that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. You see, many of the positions that people take have more to do with spiritual dynamics than intellectual dynamics. In fact, it was Blaise Pascal who said in his Pensies, the name of the title of his, uh, a collection of his sayings, which means but literally in French, his thoughts, but his friends after his death, he died at 39, compiled all of his thoughts because they were so profound and published them for the rest of us to enjoy. But in there, he said something very interesting about the way people um, process information. He said, we like to think that we use logic to come to our conclusions, but rarely do we do that. He says, what we do is we are moved by our emotions and then we use our intellect to rationalize what our emotions have already told us is true. And I think that when you examine your own thought process many times, you're going to find that that's the way it works a good deal of the time. I think when I'm shopping for something, many times I find myself uh, 
looking at something and going, oh, I want it. And then I create a whole scenario of why I can convince my wife that I actually need to have this. And that it's not really for me. It, it's for all of us, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and it's really kind of when you realize that you, you just... Um, I've developed a, a policy that basically when I want something, I step back and I leave it alone for a day or two and I pray about it. I say, Lord, you know, if that's something I should get, then just, you know, it'll be there and you'll provide. And if it's not there, it's not available or my attitude changes, then it was something that you didn't have for me. But I, I'm, I'm very, very aware of how I can convince myself to believe stuff that isn't true. And think about that, how you view other people, that we can be very paranoid about other people. We, we look at their actions and we draw conclusions where we start justifying the insecurity we feel over their actions by creating a scenario. scenario. We create this whole storyline about, well, they're doing this for that reason and this reason, and therefore, and we can end up way out there in left field drawing conclusions and believing that we're observing things when in fact we're just simply interpreting our own emotions and giving us rational, what seems to us rational arguments for believing that. Why did they look at me that way? Why didn't they talk to me? Why, you know, oh, why didn't they call me? Why didn't they write me a letter? Why didn't they answer my email? We can come up with all sorts of explanations and maybe the simple explanation is they haven't got around to it yet or they're busy or they didn't get it or they were thinking about something else. I think about how many times my mind is in the clouds and I don't even know if people notice people who are around me, not meaning to be offensive. I just, or say they're not worth noticing. I'm just saying, man, I just got a lot of stuff going on. But I think what happens is many times we fail to realize that when it's all said and done, the devil uses our imagination to take us captive, to fill our minds with all sorts of terrible thoughts and ugly thoughts and bitter thoughts, and resentful thoughts and judgmental thoughts and delusional thoughts. And we begin to live in this realm of the imagination that we think is truth. And really, I know that I am incapable of knowing the truth and understanding the truth without the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, opening my eyes, opening my understanding, revealing to me what is really the truth. And I think that that's what's so important here, because when I find people who are not walking with the Lord, who are walking in, in, in ways that I consider to be uh, deceptions, you know, I mean, I have, I have relatives who um, believe they're going to heaven regardless of how they live. They, they feel like they can behave in any way because God loves them so much they're getting to go to heaven anyway. And the thing I know for a truth is that they don't know Jesus. They've never come to the Lord. I have... I have relatives who believe that we were put here by aliens and that, uh, uh, you know, there is no God. There's an aliens who planted us here. And, and uh, I mean, they are, they are locked. They're so firmly fixed in that opinion. There's really not much or anything I can say to them. But I just think it's a deception. I think that Satan has taken them captive and giving them a replacement theology because they don't want to believe the one that they would have to confess their sins and admit that there's many choices they've made in their life that are just evil, wicked, and sinful. Uh, I get that. Most of us don't want to have to ever admit that we have sinned about anything. Humbling ourselves through confession is probably uh, the most uncomfortable thing we ever have to do. But that's where we have to keep in mind that when we have people in our life that we're trying to reach for Christ, they're people who can't repent on their own. They have to be led by God. He has to grant them repentance, Paul says. And that repentance is, happens when he leads them to the truth, that he begins to show them the path to the truth. Because the enemy has taken them captive. They are entrapped by Satan. And he's, he's doing his best to make sure that they live their life in a way that fulfills what he wants and not what God wants. So it's really, in the end, it's not a battle between you and that person. It's a contest really between God and the devil over this individual soul. And the most powerful thing that we can do is not argumentation. The most powerful thing we do is prayer that we can pray that God would begin to speak into their life. You know, as a pastor, when I get up to preach, one of the things I've realized a long time ago is it doesn't matter how clearly or eloquently or powerfully I present a message. If the Holy Spirit doesn't use what I say to touch people's lives, it's just going to fall on deaf ears. Only the Holy Spirit can touch a heart 
that the word becomes animated within it, and suddenly there's a compelling reality of truth. When the pastor sat to me and said, do you want to ask Jesus into your heart? I knew immediately that was the truth, and I needed Jesus. He never had to convince me. The Holy Spirit did it all by himself. So pray for these folks. Pray that people who you love that don't know Jesus and see what God does.